Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the third episode of Ask the Farmer. Uh, I've had two uh, previous uh, episodes, had some really great questions asked, and I uh, really had a lot of fun uh, answering those questions and uh, looking forward to, to another good episode this evening. Uh, you can see we're in the uh, shop tonight, combine behind me. We've been working on it. If you remember during our wheat harvest videos, if you watched them, we had problems with the uh, combine overheating one, or under the big load that it was in in our record setting wheat crop. But anyway, we got the, uh, got the radiator pulled out, found a place that could work on radiators up in Mayfield, Kentucky, got it carried up there. And when we got the thing off and shined the light from the backside, it can look through all the cores and everything. I'd say at least 60% of the cores were plugged up, so most likely that was the that, that was the reason. Uh, uh, these uh, machines make a whole lot of dust, and all that dust is going up there. The fans pulling it through the radiator, and if if you don't do a tip-top job blowing it out before you get it wet, the stuff kind of you know congeals together, and uh, when it dries out, it's rock hard, and then really there's no chance of uh, blowing it out. Uh, after that, and the uh, aluminum fins are so delicate that if you get too aggressive with a pressure washer, you'll fold the fins over, which is what I did uh, when I very first got this combine without realizing how delicate they were. So anyway, it's getting overhauled. Uh, hopefully get that radiator back uh, next week, get this thing buttoned up and get ready for corn harvest. So anyway, a uh, little update where, where we're at. Let's get to the questions. Uh, Bob Crone asks, uh, back a farm in North Carolina 40 years ago, and back then everybody used to run a disc and moldboard plow over the entire farm after each harvest, then disc before spring planting. I think I know why that practice has gone by the wayside, but can you expand on the topic a little bit? I do remember all the fields back then were super clean and pretty, though. Well, Bob, uh, a lot has changed in agricultural technology in the last 40 years. Uh, Hardly anybody uses a moldboard plow anymore. There's still a lot of farmers uh, that practice conventional tillage, which is, uh, which is plowing the ground. But uh, I'd say in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, no-till started making a way uh, throughout the U.S. as uh, these chemical companies introduced more chemicals that would kill the weeds and without having, to, without having to plow the ground. And then really in the 90s, early 2000s, it really took over. Uh, me personally, I do not believe in tillage at all, only as an absolutely last resort and usually to uh, smooth the ground out and prepare it. Say if you had to do uh, clear a tree line out or something like that, or you did some dirt work and you need to smooth the ground out, level it out, you know, we'll do a tillage pass there and then no till from there on out. Like I've got a couple of uh, uh, fields that we took out of pasture a couple years ago and they're rough as a cob and I'm gonna have to do some tillage on them. They're just too rough to farm the way, way they are. But uh, a moldboard plow, the way it's designed is it, uh, it's got a cupped, it's got a cupped blade and anyway, it, uh, you set it however deep you want to. Most of them probably set it around maybe 12 inches deep and it slices, through the ground, it lifts the dirt, uh, it lifts the soil up and then flips it over. And really the big design, purpose design, and really the big purpose of a mobile plow is to take anything that's on the top, whether it's an old crop residue or maybe it's uh, grass, it's sod or something, and to flip it and get it under the dirt to where you've got fresh dirt to, uh, to work with. Uh, you know, the tillage implements 40 years ago were not near as big, not near as heavy, and not, not as aggressive. And just when you had a bunch of sod or a bunch of heavy residue, those tillage implements just didn't want to cut through it real good. So you use a mobile plow to, uh, to flip the soil over and bury all that residue. And then the other plows you had, like the disc and stuff, would be able to work, the, uh, work, work that soil up into a fine powder and make a real good seed bed. Also, back then, uh, planters weren't near as far advanced as what they are now, and you needed, you know, a powdery seed bed in order to be able to successfully plant your crop. They just, they weren't heavy enough. They didn't have enough down pressure to be able to cut through very much stuff and be able to accurately place the seed. So, like I said, a lot's changed, uh, you know, in the, last, in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, I firmly believe no-till is the way to go. There's a lot of people out there that will argue with me that don't agree with me. But anyway, I'll expand. Uh, I'll expound on the on the no-till topic in a, another question a little bit later on in this episode. But I hope that answers your question. 
Uh, Larry Tyson asks, how's the bus project going? Well, Larry, the uh, bus project, it's, uh, it's on hold right now. Uh, we haven't done any work to it since the late spring as we simply haven't had time. Uh, you know, we did quite a bit of work on it uh, this winter. Uh, we ripped all the seats out, ripped all the, uh, the wood, uh, all the wood flooring out of it because it was half rotten, uh, painted, uh, painted the metal, metal floor, laid uh, new vinyl uh, flooring in there. Uh, we ran electricity to it. Uh, I built a set of bunk beds in there. We got a couple of mattresses in there. Added uh, AC, or we added one AC unit in there, and uh, that's where that's where we've been at. I I simply haven't had any time to work on. Heck, I hadn't even had enough time to do what I need to do, taking care of the farm. Uh, my friends that are involved in it, uh, most of them are involved in agriculture too, and uh, I mean this is our busy season. We simply haven't had time to to do anything, but. Hopefully, uh, after we get this crop out, we talk about maybe here in August, maybe doing a little something to it if we can like all get together, get on the same schedule, and get out here one Saturday or so and work on it. But I don't know if that'll happen. But definitely, hopefully, uh, you know, when this winter gets here, we get our crop out. You know, get past the holidays and stuff. Hopefully, we'll be able to buckle down and get quite a bit more done on it. Uh, next question, uh, Mike Hansen: Is there a reason you do not till your fields? How often do you have to fertilize? Yeah, Mike. There's a there's a big reason we don't till, till our fields. Like uh, like I mentioned in an earlier question, tillage is not good for the soil. Think about everything that lives in the soil. There's actually more things living beneath the soil surface than there is above the soil surface. Now, when you look out across the landscape, see all the different plants, the animals, trees, everything else. There's way more living up under the soil surface, you know, whether it be uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, protozoa, uh, you know, wor earthworms. Uh, I mean, it's a whole host of stuff lives up under the soil. And anytime you plow the soil, you're destroying the habitat of all that stuff that lives in the soil. Now, there are some harmful things that live in the soil, but by far the bulk of the stuff that lives in the soil is actually beneficial to growing plants. All right, we just had somebody show up the shop. I'll have to uh, continue this uh, again here in a little bit. All right, we're back. Uh, Mike, uh, finished answering your question. Uh, another reason we don't till the soil is every time you till the soil, uh, you're releasing uh, carbon back into the atmosphere. And carbon is extremely beneficial to the soil and especially to plants growing in, in the soil. Uh, uh, whenever you plow the soil, you introduce a lot more oxygen into the soil and all those microbes and everything, they really start to feed quickly and they're feeding on the organic matter and releasing carbon back into the into the atmosphere. Well, that organic matter, you know, once it gets burned up, your soil is not going to be near as healthy or as productive. You know, uh, uh, organic matter contains a whole lot of nutrients. It's, extreme, it's extremely absorbent of water. Uh, each 1% of organic matter you have in the soils equals to an extra inch of water holding capacity in the soil. So, you know, over the course of time, the more plowing you do, the less organic matter you have, and uh, the less resistant your soils are gonna be to drought. You know, if you go and look out into the woods and pull a soil sample there, those soils are gonna be about 8% organic matter. Here in West Tennessee, in a conventionally plowed uh, field that's been plowed for years and years, you're probably going, only going to be looking at about a half a percent of organic matter. Uh, that's where, where we're at when we started no-tilling back, uh, uh, no-tilling everything in 2002. We were about a half percent organic matter. Now, ever since switching to no-till and then implementing cover crops about 10 years later and also introducing wheat into the rotation, we've been able to increase our organic matter in our soils back up to around 3%. Now, we're not where we want to be on our soils. You know, it's, it's, not, it's going to be something where I don't ever think that we've arrived. We're where we want to be. It's always going to be a constant improvement year after year after year of trying to build our soils back up and be, be resilient. You know, I mean, going back to the soil structure, every time you plow, you destroy so soil structure. You know, soil isn't just the particles of silt that you see in the ground. It's also got a lot of pore space. And even, uh, even though you're kind of fluffing the ground up whenever you plow, when, after you get a rain, all that soil collapses on itself and all that pore space you have that holds water, that holds uh, oxygen and everything else, all of that is, col is collapsed. 
and it takes a long time for that soil structure to be be built back up. So uh, after you get one good rain on it and kind of seals the soil off, every time it rains after that, water has a hard time infiltrating that soil and it's more apt to run off. And when it runs off, well then you've got erosion. Erosion is carrying your topsoil down to the creek. It's also carrying a lot of the nutrients that you applied to the soil. It's carrying it off. So that's a lot of money that you're losing right there in nutrients and product productivity of the, of the soils. The one thing a lot of people don't, don't think about is the microbial life and how vast it is. You know, just think about how functional you would be is if every year a tornado came through and blew your house away. <laughs> After a while, you just kind of give up. You wouldn't be very functional at all. It's kind of the same, same way with tillage. You're destroying the habitat of all those microbes, earthworms, and everything else. And then uh, eventually you, you're left with very low populations in the soil. And a lot of those uh, uh, fungi, uh, microbes, bacteria, a lot of that stuff is beneficial, especially, it's especially beneficial in helping keeping the bad stuff, the bad fungi, the bad bacteria, that kind of stuff, keeping it, it suppressed. Because in the soil, you know, you got prey and you got predator. It's a whole complex food chain. Uh, it's a whole complex food chain down in the soil. So hope that kind of answers your question. There's, <laughs> there's so much more I could say on the topic, but heck, this video would be would be an hour long. But that's just kind of a base overview of why we don't believe in tillage, and we're a firm believer of of no till. All right, here's a little add-in on the uh, no till question. As I was editing this video, I realized that. Uh, you know, I've got a graph that I came up with that uh, really shows the reason why we switched to, to no no till and then cover crops. One of the bigger re one of the biggest reasons why, and uh, that is water infiltration and water storage. Uh, this graph is from our uh, adaptive management plots that we've been doing for six years now, where we have replicated strips in an eight acre field of no till and cover crops side by side. We've got it replicated four times. Well, a couple years ago, a company that wanted to uh, put some uh, uh, soil moisture probes on our on our farms to kind of see if there was any difference in uh, water infiltration and water holding capacity, uh, you know, no-till and cover crop. And, and well, that field that we got with the replicated side-by-side -side strips was ideal for it. So this is the data we gathered from uh, that year. Uh, we had corn on it that year. So, you know, a very water intensive crop and the results are out and but as you look at the graph the higher the number the drier the soil is so as you can see the no-till plot you know they both started off right there equal at the, when the corn was planted and then as the season goes along the the difference between the two gets wider and wider with the no-till being drier it was losing uh, more to it was losing more moisture to evaporation if you notice where the graph suddenly dips downwards, that's where we had a rainfall event. And as you can see, and as you can see, the cover crop plots were actually able to infiltrate more water during that rain event than what the no-till was. The no-till plots ran more water off the surface of the soil than what the no-till. And that helps explain the further gra uh, widening between the two plots, uh, so two plots side by side throughout the season. And these plots, these were 38 foot wide plots and you know the, so the pros were only 38 feet between between each other so uh, this uh, this is probably one of the most single most important pieces of data that I've I've ever I've ever come up with and is a prime example of why we switch to no-till and why we use no-till and uh, of why we use no-till and cut co and cover crops because we're able to store get more much more water into the soil and are able to store it all season long uh, next question is from John St. Andrea. says, uh, I worked on a farm when I was younger and we cultivated our crops. Has cultivating largely gone away due to GMO crops that are grown these days? Uh, John, uh, I mean, no-till started before we ha actually had GMO crops. I think the first GMO crop was, uh, was BT, corn, and cotton, probably somewhere early mid 90s and that was a trait that was introduced to those crops to make it resistant to pests and more specifically the more more specifically the lepidoptera pests uh, we didn't get a herbicide resistance in our crops until a few years after that and then you know the first herbicide resistant crop that was introduced was roundup ready and people were no-tilling 
uh, before that. We weren't because we were just, uh, we were slow to transition. Uh, you know, we had been getting along with the way we were doing things. But eventually we saw that, you know, in order to be sustainable and to stay in the business and kind of mitigate some of our risks and lower our costs, we didn't need to switch to no-till too. So uh, in the 80s and early 90s, I mean, there were other chemicals that we could use to kill the weeds. But then when Roundup Ready Crops were introduced, I can't remember exactly when they were introduced, maybe 97, 98, maybe some, somewhere along, along there, it made, the, it made the practice of no-till a whole lot easier because you could plant a crop and the only thing you need to do is spray Roundup and it killed everything else out there. It made it extremely simple. Our use of residual herbicides kind of went by the, uh, by the wayside. Uh, use of other chemistries kind of went by the wayside because we could spray one chemical and it was a relatively cheap chemical too and we could spray it all over the crops and kill, every, and kill, kill, all, kill all the weeds. Uh, so, uh, and, as I, and as I spoke to in the, in the previous question, you know, like I said, again, there's people that will argue with me, but it's my belief that no-till is a much better practice. It is far more sustainable than what cultivating is. Uh, you know, just for all the, all the benefits that I, I talked about in the, in, the, in the previous question. Yes, we are using synthetic chemicals on our fields to suppress weeds and insects, but at the same time, we're protecting our most important natural resource, the soil. So, you know, the, the base answer to your question is, is that uh, GMOs just allowed uh, the, uh, the no-till practice to become that much easier. Now, in the last 13 to 15 years, it's not as easy as it was for the last 10 years because we uh, started getting herbicide-resistant weeds. You know, Mother Nature's always going to find a way. It doesn't matter what you do, Mother Nature will find a way to adapt and persevere. And that's what some of these weeds have done. Uh, you know, by using just straight Roundup on all our crops with no other chemicals, we were selecting for one molecule. And when you got a vast population out there, there's going to be one or two that have a little bit different makeup and are going to be resistant to whatever it is you're spraying. You know, it's not any different than, uh, you know, having, uh, than having bacteria that's resistant to antibiotics, which is what we're seeing in the, in the medical community. Nature's always going to find a way to... Uh, to adapt and, and overcome and change and, and, per, and persevere. And, but we, uh, by only using that one chemical roundup on a big part of our acres, we speeded up the process because we were selecting for one, for one molecule. And then when the roundup resistant uh, uh, pigweed came on the, came on the scene, uh, roundup resistant mare's tail was one of the first ones to come up. It's not really a serious weed and a competitive weed, but Roundup resistant pigweed, it came into our area around 2007, 2008. It was a game changer because pigweed is, it's the most aggressive weed I've ever seen. It can grow up to three inches a day, uh, left unchecked. It can produce one to two million seeds per plant. It's extremely competitive. Just one pigweed per like four or five foot row of cotton can reduce your yield somewhere about like 40 to 50 percent. It's an extremely aggressive weed that uh, produces uh, a lot of seed and can uh, overwhelm a field in, a, in short order. Usually within, within two, three years, uh, pigweeds can completely take over a field if they're left un, unchecked. So uh, as farmers, we had to uh, kind of change our practices. We had to start using uh, residual herbicides again to try and keep these weeds from uh, from, from germinating. We had to overlap our herbicides so there was no gap to where weeds can germinate. We had to start using other forms of chemistries. And then but what we've seen over the last three years is these pigweeds, because they have such genetic diversity and you have male and female plants, which allows a lot more uh, interchanging of different genes, uh, these pigweeds have quickly become resistant to almost every form of chemical that we've got, and going forward, I'm not sure where we go on controlling this weed. Uh, here on our farm, we use a bunch of cultural methods, uh, cover crops being the primary one to uh, help control these weeds and not relying solely on synthetic chemicals. Uh, we spend a big part of our summer going around all of our fields and, uh, and chopping or hand pulling these weeds to try and make sure we don't have any go to seed. So. That's probably a little bit more than what you asked for, but hopefully you kind of get the, hopefully you 
hopefully you kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, next question is from uh, Jack Baumgartner. Uh, and it kind of relates to uh, my answers on the previous uh, questions. It said, uh, uh, my question is, is how we came to decide to do no-till crop on, on our farm. And uh, just curious why farmers do different things. Well, Jack, the, the primary reason we decided to go to no-till is, you know, I'm sure our soils are different than what your soils are. But here in West Tennessee, we have a very silty loam. And whenever it's plowed and then it gets rain on it, it's, it's like it almost turns to sugar and just dissolves and goes away. It, the soils we have are extremely highly erodible. And we don't have very much flat ground. Most of our, uh, most of our land is uh, gently rolling hills. Uh, uh, most of what we farm is 2 to 5% slopes. There might be some parts of our fields that are 5 to 7% slopes. So, you know, we got, uh, you know, you got water running down a hill plowed ground, it's going to carry it off, off, off down to the creek. And as I said, I think on a previous video, uh, you know, our land was conventionally tilled for over a hundred years, you know, from where, when we started in 1882, you know, until about the year 2002, all of our land was conventionally plowed and, and intensively plowed, plowed multiple times a year. And it severely degraded our soils. In some parts of our fields, I can take a shovel out there now and dig down two to three inches and I'm already at subsoil. There's just no topsoil left because it was all eroded over, over the years. And, you know, we, uh, we utilize a lot of terraces. We use, utilize contour farming and everything, but that's, uh, that kind of stuff is really only a Band-Aid. And actually, no-till is just a Band-Aid too. In my opinion, it's not the solution to the problem. Uh, in my opinion, the solution to the problem is keeping something growing on your ground 12 months out of the year, having living roots in the soil to really anchor it down, be putting carbon in, be, uh, to be putting carbon in, into, into the soil. So uh, I know uh, other parts of the U.S. soils are completely different. Maybe it's a lot flatter. Maybe there's a lot more clay content in the, in the soil, a lot higher CEC values. And all of that leads to soil that's not as erodible as what ours is. And that's why in other parts of the country, conventional tillage is not as detrimental to the soil as what it is here in West Tennessee. Uh, for the most part, pretty much all the farmers, or most, the majority of the farmers in West Tennessee utilize at least some form of no-till. Uh, they might do a little tillage here and there, maybe to, uh, maybe to warm the ground up in front of planting or try to decompose the residue from the previous crop a little bit. But generally it's pretty light tillage and not deep in inv inv invasive, invasive tillage. Uh, you know, some, some people might only do tillage once every two years or once every three, three years, you know, maybe in front of a corn crop, but then they no-till in, in their soybeans. So farmers in West Tennessee do it a lot of different ways. And generally speaking, farmers all across the nation do it a whole lot of different ways. Now I do believe, you know, I haven't farmed in any other parts of the area. I'm not an expert, but I do believe that no-till is possible in pretty much any environment, any soil. There's a way to do it. It just has to be figured out how to do it. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be the best thing to do every year. There's some years that conventional tillage will probably produce a higher yielding crop just because of the weather situations in that year. But I think long term, when you look at the soil structure, the organic matter, everything you're doing by benefiting the soil no-till, I believe long term, year after year, once, you, once you've gotten your soils acclimated to being no-till, once you've got your system in place, I believe long term it's going to be more, more beneficial to you. And then, you know, I also, I also believe that just one single, one single tillage pass after you've got an established no-till field, can really put you can, can it can really set you back several years work several years worth of work again that's my opinion you know there's going to be other people that disagree and and that's fine well guys i think that's got uh i think that's got another five questions uh answered uh well i know we were kind of mostly only on one topic in this video but again it's probably the topic i'm most passionate about it's uh, it's about no-till and it's talking talking about the soils you know, there were, uh, you know, four out of the five questions were a little bit different, but, but very, but very, very closely related. So it gave me the opportunity to really get in depth in, in that topic. And, uh, if there's still something you're not 
clear about on the topic of, of no-till or maybe you know what we're seeing in the soil, uh, please uh, feel free to drop another question in the in the comments below, and I'll get to it at, at some at some point. So again, I appreciate you watching. Uh, hopefully, uh, next video uh, a combine will be be going going back together and be getting it ready for harvest. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.